QSO Today, episode 279, Bob Dixon, W8ERD. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers and accessories for the radio amateur. It should be noted that ICOM is a proud sponsor of Youngsters on the Air, or Yoda, events coming up this December. Check the Yoda link in this week's show notes pages. This episode is also sponsored by QRP Labs, makers of the popular QCX kit transceiver and a whole host of other kit receivers and parts for the home brewer. My thanks to ICOM America and QRP Labs for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, your host. Bob Dixon, W8ERD, spent 49 years as an Ohio State University radio astronomer working on SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and supporting the electronic and communications needs of the university. After Bob's retirement, he became one of the key members of the Delaware Amateur Radio Club's deployment of an amateur radio mesh network to support their ARES activity. W8ERD is my QSO today. W8ERD, this is Eric, 4Z1UG. Are you there, Bob? Yes, W8ERD is here. Good to talk to you, Eric. Bob, thanks for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? Well, my father had this big old wooden console radio in our living room that uh, was for AM broadcast primarily. But he would occasionally tune around on the shortwave bands that were on that radio and hear interesting things. And then I got interested in it, and then I would start tuning around. And uh, that really is what sparked my interest in uh, radio. And I could listen to ham radio that way as well as international broadcast. And about what time was this? What were the years? What was happening in those days? Well, let's see. That was probably in the early 50s. Not too much that I can remember was happening in those days. It was all AM, and I, I heard some local hams in Wisconsin that sometimes would try to work DX on AM and were trying to work Africa. I never heard the African stations, but I guess they did. What was the hometown? Madison, Wisconsin. And did you happen to have any hams in the neighborhood, or when you started to become aware of amateur radio, did you become aware of hams locally? Well, there were a few in, in Madison, but not close to where I lived. What really got me started then, when I entered junior high school, and in the seventh grade, I discovered that there was a ham radio club in the high school. It was taught by the geometry teacher, and so I entered that club, and they had uh, code practice lessons and all that. So I really loved that, and her name was Elizabeth Lug. And she taught geometry, and I learned the Morse code that way, and I was able to get my novice license. And so did several other people in the class. And so we used to have a net where we would talk to each other on 80-meter CW. And what year did you get your license, and how old were you? It was in 1955, when I was 16 years old. And you remember your first call sign? Yes, W9OKN. And did you keep that call sign when you upgraded? No, when I moved from Wisconsin to Ohio... I changed to the W8 call sign that I have now, and I kept that when I upgraded to my extra class. Were there other mentors that helped you along? Other people in the radio club who were older, like they were senior high school students, uh, they helped, and we did a lot of interesting things, like we went on field day. And then, of course, when I came to Ohio, I joined the Ohio State University Radio Club, and they did all kind of things, like field day and special events and things like that. Do you remember your first rig? Yes, it was a uh, World Radio Labs Globe Chief 90, and 90 stands for 90 watts transmitter, crystal controlled, and the receiver was a uh, Halicraft was SX99. And you say you were working 80 meters with the local uh, novices as well. It's my understanding that, reading your bio, that you've worked all countries except North Korea. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And was, unfortunately, I could have had North Korea. They were on the air a number of years ago. And I think it was a fellow from Poland that somebody, he was there operating. And he was the pie-offs were huge, and he was going to be there forever on assignments. So I thought, there's no hurry. So I didn't do anything. And about a week later, the authorities closed in on him and closed the station down and and deported him. So I missed out on North Korea. 
Now, when you moved to Ohio and upgraded to uh, Extra, were you a DXer or contester? Did you have a preference in terms of what you like to focus on? Well, my preference was I was in the ARES, and we did special events and emergency communications. But, yes, I like to work DX on CW. So CW would be your favorite operating mode, or at least it was in those days? Yes, that's right. Is it still your favorite operating mode? Well, when I get on HF, which is not very often, but yes, it is. And what is your favorite operating mode if you're not on HF? Well, these days it's mesh radio because that's a new technology and it's something that's close to the work I did professionally. I used to work with video conferencing, and so mesh radio fits right in with that. And it's very challenging, really, because you have to make audio and video work at the same time when you have weak signals and lots of complications. So let's touch on the mesh networking portion a little bit later. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your education and career? Were you driven into the technology by amateur radio? Absolutely. From high school, I was in radio club about the whole time, and that got me to Ohio State University, or sorry, the University of Wisconsin in electrical engineering. And I worked all through that. I got my bachelor's and master's degrees at Wisconsin. And then I went to Ohio State University where I got my Ph.D. in electrical engineering. And I worked under Professor John Krause, who's WHJK, who's also a very famous ham. And then I, that just, I just stayed in that field the whole time. Now, were you planning on being an academic? Is that what you were with a Ph.D. from Ohio State? Well, I worked at Ohio State University for 49 years. But I was not, I didn't have to have the title professor. I was an a academic who did research and I occasionally an administrator, but never had the title professor. So you weren't teaching classes. The research you were doing, you were sharing with the other professors in the school? Yes, that's right. I uh, occasionally would give guest lectures or do things like that, but never regularly taught. Now, I read in a Tapper Bulletin from 2015 that, as you just said, you retired there after 49 years of being at Ohio State University. But Ohio State University is famous for the Big Ear Radio Telescope and SETI. Is that what you worked on, and, and what, what are those things? Absolutely. That's what I worked on when I, when I was there the whole time. I was the, became the assistant director of the Big Ear Radio Telescope under, under John Krause. And I started the SETI program there to search for life outside of the Earth. I had uh, gone to work for NASA for one summer in their special SETI project that they had going on. And uh, we, we, we did the largest SETI program that had ever been done up to that time using a large radio telescope. There are radio telescopes out at Goldstone in California. Is the Big Ear a bigger telescope than the Goldstone dishes out there? Well, I'd say it's comparable in size. It's, it's equivalent in size to about a 175-foot dish. Is that multiple dishes make that, or was it physically that large? It was physically that large. It was just a single large telescope. Unlike a steerable dish antenna, it had a, a fixed standing parabola, and it was a big flat reflector that would reflect signals into the parabola, and they were then focused into a feed horn. And did you hear any signals from deep space? Yes. We, uh, of course, I love to say I'm not allowed to say, but yes, we did uh, one very famous one known as the wow signal. And that's because it, when we received it, the, the, our staff person who was looking at the computer printout at the time saw it, and it was just such a perfect signal, he wrote W-O-W exclamation mark on the computer printout. And then that name has stuck ever since then to be known as the wow object, and it was the one thing that was the most perfect signal I think ever received by anybody. But unfortunately, it was only there once for a couple of minutes, and then it went away, so we never could verify or catch it again or make, make more measurements of it to see where it was coming from. So if an intelligence beyond our galaxy, or maybe beyond our solar system, sent a single signal, they sent to dot it, for example... That's what you'd hear. You'd only hear it once, and it would go away, right? Well, that's right. And, and of course, we, we checked all sorts of things to be sure there was no fluke. The equipment was working correctly. There was no hoax. or we, all, all those things were eliminated. So you know it really came from very far away. Unfortunately, we just don't know from where. And what did you think of the movie Contact 
with regard to looking at SETI. Do you think that's an accurate depiction of potentially what could happen if there was a SETI signal? Yes, I do. If we ever received a signal that we knew positively was there, then I think it would have great influence on our society. Is the Big Ear radio telescope still operational? Is the SETI work there still ongoing? The radio telescope is gone. It was located on land belonging to Ohio Wesleyan University, and they had equal access to it, but they never used it, actually. And uh, they, I guess, ran short of money, so they decided they would rather sell the land and get the money. And unfortunately, we had nothing to, we couldn't control that, so they sold the land, and the developer destroyed the radio telescope, so it's gone. But at the same time, we have been working on a new kind of radio telescope called Argus, which is their telescope that looks in all directions at the same time. It's a phased array, actually. And that telescope has been operating for the past 15 years now on the campus of Ohio State University. It's very small, not very sensitive, but it's very intriguing the way it works. You want to describe briefly how it works? There's about 32 elements the signals from all those elements are fed into a computer, and it forms all the beams looking over the whole sky all the time. So when nothing moves, there's no scanning, it's just that all the beams are sitting there all the time looking up in the sky as created by the computer. And if it finds anything that exceeds the noise threshold, then it will signal the alarm and send email to our technician who is in charge of running it and that we can examine it more closely, but we've never found anything so far that just really looks promising. Do you have a sense, or do you think that if there was extraterrestrial intelligence out there sending radio signals, that they might even send us something like Joe Taylor's kind of below-the-noise signals? I don't know. It's just, you know, we can't even guess what any other civilization would do. The signals we get might be something that they transmitted accidentally as a result of their normal business that they're doing, or could be something that they transmitted deliberately, but then they would have to do it for such a long time because even the nearest stars are many light years away, and more reasonably, anywhere in our galaxy would be thousands of, of light years away. And so if we find anything, it would be a miracle. And now this message from ICOM America. Wish it, wrap it, gift it. These are the code words to your XYL or significant other to get the holiday gift of an ICOM transceiver to meet your ham radio goals in the coming year. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products, so make the most of the holiday season with one of these ICOMs today. Tis the season to give your favorite ham the SDR they really want, and that's the ICOM IC7610. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest of signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling software-defined radio, or SDR, that will change the world's definition of an SDR transceiver. It is exactly the right rig for DXing, contesting, and rag chewing. Its features include RF direct sampling system, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers allowing you to listen in two places at once, and dual digicell. The ICOM IC7300 has changed the definition of an entry-level HF transceiver. This compact footprint also includes RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3-inch touchscreen, and a real-time spectrum scope or pan adapter. I have the IC7300 in my ham shack and love being able to see the activity in the bands as I'm tuning. Finally, the IC9700 is ICOM's latest entry in the VHF and UHF amateur transceiver market. The IC9700 should be at the top of every ham's wish list this holiday season, especially if EME or moon bounce or meteor scatter operation will be one of your New Year's resolutions. This all-mode transceiver works in the 2-meter, 70-centimeter, and 23-centimeter bands. Keep your competitive contesting edge with the faster processors, higher input gain, higher display resolution, and a cleaner signal. ICOM IC9700 is the pinnacle of perfection. Features include a 4.3-inch touchscreen color TFT LCD display, dual watch operation and full duplex operation in satellite mode, real-time high-spectrum scope and waterfall display, voice recording playback function with an SD memory card, 
and it has the same form factor as the IC7300 and will look beautiful next to any of your new ICOM rigs. Wish it, wrap it, and gift it are the code words that I opened this message from ICOM. However, if subtle hints or leaving ham magazines open to full-page ICOM ads does not seem to have the desired effect on your XYL, then just tell her that you are pining after a new ICOM rig and that you know where the nearest ICOM dealer is near you, and you will be happy to save her the trouble of wrapping it and gifting it. And when you buy that new ICOM holiday rig, be sure to tell your ICOM dealer that you heard it here on the QSO Today podcast. Fa la 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 la. And now back to our program. I actually had never thought about it until this moment that those signals are on a path and they'll pass us by if we're not listening at the time that they're passing us by. That's right. And if they are scanning, you know, like they're scanning a signal around looking, not looking, but sending a signal by scanning around in different directions, the chances of us looking at them when they're looking at us are not very large. Do you have a radio astronomy set up at your house? No, I don't. Is there a place in ham radio for amateur astronomers, radio astronomers, and do you think that hams could actually build a large enough array on their property that they could actually do some serious looking? As a matter of fact, they do. There's an organization called the Society of Amateur Radio Astronomers, uh, which consists mainly of hams. And many of them have antennas and radios that are on all the time. I just recently subscribed to their mailing list, and it's really interesting to see what they're doing. I found online your introduction to mesh networks on YouTube, where you discuss the basics of mesh networking. For the audience that hasn't heard us talk about mesh networking before, even as recently as the last episode, what is mesh networking, and how did you become involved in it? I can't remember how I got started in this, but mesh networking is a system of stations scattered around, and they transmit and receive each other's broadcasts, and the the software is, is such that it automatically creates a mesh network linking all the stations together. And that happens automatically, so nobody actually has to be there or run it or do anything. And the stations automatically send their call sign every so often, which is predominantly done at 2400 megahertz. And the equipment that's used is Wi-Fi equipment, which is reprogrammed to work as ham radio stations and moved to a different channel. Now, the Wi-Fi channels have probably one to like 15 or so. So we use channel minus two to get away from all the other Wi-Fi stuff that's going on. Now, the problem is the Wi-Fi is less than a watt for all our transmitters, and so that's what we're stuck with. And so the stage, the signals are not strong. We have to use very high antennas, high gain, high gain antennas, and it's still a struggle to keep everything going. But it's become very popular in many places around the country and people are now using it for public service events. Uh, We have now just very very shortly, we'll have working a couple portable video stations where we can go out into the field and set up a video station and send live video from wherever we need to through the mesh network to a served agency like Red Cross or the Emergency Management Agency. And so we do a great deal of public service in this way. Where are you located now? It's my understanding that you're in a valley. It's the Delaware Amateur Radio Association. Okay. I'm not on the top of a hill. I'm sort of intermediate. But we have worked out a deal with the uh, emergency management agency that they let us put our tower, our antennas on all of their towers. There's nine of them around the county. And they let us go from about halfway, which is maybe 150 feet or so, So that's pretty high, and it works fairly well, but it's not the greatest in the world. And what kind of equipment are you using? Do you have a brand? Are you using, like, retasked Linksys routers for this project? That's how we got started. Linksys routers were used for everything. But then we moved on to other brands like Ubiquiti, which is the current brand, because it's uh, more sensitive, more easily programmed, more easily controlled. So all of our stuff is Ubiquiti at the moment. So you've got nine sites around your area. Who else is on it? Do you have other hams on it? I mean, have you gotten a lot of hams on the network? Yes. There are maybe a half a dozen hams who are active and on the air 
from time to time. Uh, we would like to have a lot more, and gradually it, it happens, and gradually we grow into other counties. When adjacent county, in fact, two adjacent counties have systems, and we recently have linked onto them, so our system has grown significantly now. And what kind of geographical footprint do you have with nine sites? Are you covering the entire area in between those sites? Yes, we are. The idea is, in the field, we have a highly directional antenna, the dish antenna, that we point at whatever is the nearest one of those towers. And by, by linking the towers, which happens automatically, then... Uh, we can get the signal to wherever we need to go. And what kind of services are you running on your network? You mentioned a video just a minute ago. Are there any other services that you're running, and how do the hams communicate with each other? Well, there's video and audio, chat services that run. Chat is the way most times it's done. So do you have a chat server that someone built and that's part of the network? Yes, the chat server runs in several of the stations that are on the air. I think, you know, for people that aren't familiar with these routers and stuff, you're actually working in a like a TCP IP environment, meaning that it looks like a big local area network. Yeah, it looks like a big Ethernet, actually, but it's running over the, over the air. So your chat server, for example, is that a computer on the network that somebody built? Is it on a Raspberry Pi? What is it exactly? Because you need these devices in the network in order to be able to communicate. We have it running in two of the nine stations that are base stations, you might say, for the network, because there's enough memory in there that we can be running it at the same time as running the network. It would be better if it ran on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we don't have anybody that's available to make that work that way, so this is just the way it is at the moment. To speak with audio, are you using, like, All-Star or some kind of a telephone server in order to be able to transmit audio between the various stations, like an asterisk server, for example, which is a PBX. We don't have a PBX. It, right now, it just goes point to point. If I want to talk to you, then uh, I set up an audio system like I run Linphone or something like that, and then uh, we can talk back and forth to each other. So you have to know my IP address in order to be able to talk to me. That's right. Well, I guess with uh, six or seven stations, that's probably not hard. We talk about a mesh network in other places, and sometimes what I hear people say is, well, you know, the only problem with mesh networking is is that, you know, hams are cheap and they won't build a mesh node of their own. How did you incentivize the six that you have in order to build nodes of their own? And do you think there's a way to incentivize the rest of the hams in the area to build a node of their own? Well, I, as far as I know, nobody has built a node of their own. We all use commercial stuff that's reprogrammed. The software is widely available. Uh, it's, it really would be a great idea if people could build their own and make something that was more powerful than, than a watt. That would, make, that would make all the difference in the world. You know, even with the ubiquity stuff, the ubiquity equipment is not expensive. I think um, what a bullet and an antenna is less than $100. You need, I guess, a power over Ethernet adapter to power the device, and then you need a kind of a network to run it on in the house or even, you know, some simple stuff that runs into your computer. It does seem like a big expense considering what hams would pay for other types of equipment. I guess I'm just wondering if there's a way that you've thought of to induce more hams to build the standard fare, the stuff that you're already using. Well, we don't have a good way. We, we encourage people by using we, we have a monthly net for a mesh people and we have a monthly breakfast and we get people together and we talk about things and talk about what's happening but I have never heard any discussion about somebody building something from scratch. I'm not saying scratch, I'm just saying just getting people to buy the package. I saw in your YouTube video that you actually had a very nice network diagrams and a list of things that could be used, a list of equipment that you would buy to create a node of your own. I guess I'm just wondering if you found a way to get more hams to buy a node of their own so that they could become part of the network and actually provide more activity on the mesh network than an occasional or a weekly net, for example. Well, occasionally we talk about it at our radio club meetings and we give demonstrations there. And little by little, more people do get on the air, but it's a very slow process. Well, you know what? I hope that it gets built out. Do you think uh, mesh networking is something that might interest kids who seem to be more computer savvy and are more interested in computer-type things? 
Sure, and I think they would love it if they could do video back and forth to each other. With their smartphones, perhaps, running through the amateur network. Yes, and you know there is now a little device that's the size of a USB port that just plugs into your laptop, and it is actually a mesh port. It's amazing how little they can make things now. Really? So it will actually act like a mesh router on the USB port of your computer? So you could actually take it outside if you're in range of the mesh network? Yes, that's right. You can do that. Now, of course, it's not very powerful because it doesn't have much of an antenna inside there, but you can certainly use it around your property. How about applications on uh, smartphones that would work with a mesh network? I think if it was something that would run over Ethernet, you could run anything you want to. I'm selfishly thinking of an application while we're talking. I'm thinking if you're running a mesh network outside and you're covering a limited area, but you're covering an area, that it would be nice to have some portable devices that could also work on the mesh, like either smartphones or portable radios, even like laptop computers. Well, I understand that at the Dayton Hamvention this past year, a number of people were seen walking around with their laptops with these little USB plugs in them and using them using the mesh network there. Do you happen to know what that device is? Or I can actually do some research and find it, and I'll put that on the show notes page for the community here. I think it's a GLV-150 or something like that, but I'm not positive. Okay, I'll look it up, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes page. Let me take a quick break here to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KG6VU, and Jeremy, KF7IJZ, where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their Ham Radio Workbenches every two weeks. George and Jeremy document their projects and make circuit boards available for sale to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Even if you're a seasoned ham radio builder, or just getting started, be sure to join George and Jeremy for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. And now back to our QSO today. Now you say that you're beginning to operate video. Is that in service of the ARES, meaning that you might take those video cameras out to a place where there's some kind of an emergency or a fire or something like that in order to be able to cover it? Yes, that's the intent. And we also do other events, like we cover races, parades, and things like that. And so we can provide video from anywhere we need to to the person in charge. Now, do you link your amateur radio repeaters using the mesh network? No, those our regular repeaters are entirely on different bands. So you're not using the mesh network as a backbone for Echolink or AllStar or something like that? No, nothing like that. I found an article in my pile of QSTs from June 2011 on a one-person, safe, portable, easy-to-erect antenna mast. Could you talk about that a little bit, and why emphasize the one-person and safe? Well, I became aware of military masts and tripods that uh, all could fit together. I became very enchanted by that. Because in field day and other events, we have to set things up in the field that is often crude and difficult and can be dangerous. And so I set out to find a way to put this all together where one person can do it in a safe way. And I derived a way to put everything all together. And there's no danger. And it worked really well, and so I wrote that article so everybody could do it now. And I've heard from other people who have now done the same thing. Now, was that, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes page as well, the masts were military, but the thing looks like it's a tripod that is almost as high as five and a half feet where the legs come together, and you actually feed the masts up through the center. So you're actually standing underneath the tripod and pushing the mast up as it goes up. Is that part of those military things, or is that a rig that you actually made or designed? Tripod is also military surplus, and all the masts are. The, the, the ones that make the tripod are, and the ones that go straight up are. And uh, so the height is limited by however much you think you can lift and how high you want to make it. How high have you taken yours up? What's an optimum height for a rig like this? Well, 30 to 40 feet, I think, is probably reasonable. And these are aluminum masks or are these uh, fiberglass? They have both kinds. The fiberglass ones do not fit through the tripod, so they can only be used 
to make the tripod legs. The aluminum ones will work for either case. What is your current rig now? I have a Yesu FT2000. Any other equipment along with it? Well, yeah, I have a Tentec uh, Titan amplifier, antenna tuner, and keyer, and little stuff like that. And when you get on, as you said earlier, when you get on HF, you like to work CW? Yes, I do. I have a stepper antenna, which covers uh, 20 through 6 meters. And for lower bands, I have a, a long dipole center fed with a remote antenna tuner. With a balanced line between the center of the antenna and the antenna tuner? Yes, open wire line from the antenna to the tuner, and then coax from there to my radio. And where is the tuner located outside? It's located at the bottom of my mast. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's kind of the antenna that I'm building here. Uh huh. Good. What kind of antenna tuner are you using? Well, it's Hamware. It's called. It's made in Germany. Hamware.de. It's plugged in and it's just looking at SWR. And when you pump the signal down the line, it automatically adjusts to reduce the SWR coming back to your radio. Yes. So there's no controls at your end. It has a memory in it. So it, it automatically senses the frequency you're transmitting at. And if you've been at that frequency before, it remembers that it will go there. But it also has manual controls if you want to manually tune it or set it up initially for various frequencies. And how does it work on 160? It works fine. So that's your broadband antenna, is that center-fed dipole with the antenna tuner at the bottom. That's right. It's my understanding that you've been involved with the Boy Scouts. How important is the Boy Scouts to your ham radio operation? And do you think the Scout organization is a good place to attract new hams? Well, I've tried to do what I can do, but I haven't succeeded very much. Uh, I have two grandsons who are in the Scouts, and I've tried to get them interested. And when they have scouting events on the air, I, I invite them to come here and talk to other hams. The problem is the signals are often not very strong, and so they can't hear each other very well, and it doesn't work. But the guy who nominated me, Ed, he, he's very active, and he runs a, a ham camp, or is heavily involved in it. And so I've gone there and helped operate the station that they operate there. I certainly think Scouts is a good way for hams to get started in, and they have a merit badge, and I am, in fact, a merit badge counselor for ham radio, but no, no hams, no scouts have ever approached me to get their merit badge in ham radio. Do you think scouts are, like, too busy with a lot of other stuff these days? I think so. I mean, I think that's the biggest problem we have in ham radio today. Right, a lot of competition from other interests. There certainly is. You know, you mentioned earlier John Kraus. It appears to me that you were the president of the John Krause Memorial Amateur Radio Club. And could you talk a little bit about who John Krause was at Ohio State and why he's remembered in a club? Well, he is a very famous professor of electrical engineering at Ohio State University. He was there for many years. He uh, invented various antennas, like the corner flector antenna and the WHJK beam antenna. And he then taught radio astronomy and started the radio observatory at Ohio State University, which was there, one of the reasons I went there. Uh, I, I would say many people, most people in electrical engineering may have heard of John Krause. He was my mentor there and taught me what I learned about many things in radio astronomy and electrical engineering. Would you say he was the beginning of the radio side of the department there at uh, Ohio State? He was probably there as long as you were? Yes, he, he started the radio astronomy effort at Ohio State University and uh, kept it going. And they had the Big Ear Telescope was in operation by the time I came there. And uh, my role then was to program the computers to analyze the data and make maps and lists of radio sources we discovered and all that sort of thing. And if we're talking 49-plus years ago, because you've been retired for some years, the computers that you were using, you were programming in Fortran or something like that? Yes. Originally, we had an IBM 1620 computer, which started programming the data, and then we had a bigger IBM uh, 7094 and then an IBM 360 in the main campus, which we used all those, which were all programmed in Fortran. Well, you tell kids nowadays that you used to uh, punch 
decks of cards, put them in a reader, and run the cards and then go for coffee so you could get your listing a couple of hours later. They have a hard time believing it, I think. That's right, but it's so true. And when we started, it was even before that, we had punched paper tape that we were using instead of punch cards. And I remember that as well. It was probably one of the reasons I didn't have an interest in computers. <laughs> it just seemed like it was just too much work. It didn't have the instant gratification that computers have now. Right. Well, we had struggled with the paper tape. You know, it was a fragile medium, and sometimes it would get torn or get dirty. And we, we, had, we created a little jig that we could paste it back together because we didn't want to lose the data. You do, you do desperate things sometimes. And now this message from QRP Labs. QRP Labs has shipped thousands of QCX QRP transceivers kits to date. The odds of working another QCX user gets better every day. If you're looking for a satisfying kit experience where you end up with an amazing performing QRP transceiver for under $50, let me say that again, for under $50, then you owe it to yourself to go to QRP Labs. We have many home brewers who listen to the QSO Today podcast. For you, QRP Labs also has parts, filters, enclosures, and other handy devices to make your home brewing experience even better. You can use these parts to either enhance your QRP Labs kits or to beef up your own homebrew designs. Be sure to browse Han's entire website. Use the link on this week's show notes page or the one in the sponsored section of the QSO Today website to get to QRP Labs to buy your QCX or any of the other fine QRP Labs kits or parts. QRP Labs is my go-to ham radio kit company. It should be yours, too. QRP Labs. And now back to our QSO Today. You received the Alan Severson Award in 2016. What is this award in ham radio, and how did you win it? Well, I was totally amazed by this. I, I had no idea this was going to happen. I was nominated by one of the, the hams who was prominent at the state here. I'm not even sure anymore what it was for. How about that? Well, we're going to have to look it up and uh, put a link to that in the show notes page then so you, we know at least who Alan Severson was. Right. What kind of impact has amateur radio had on your family life? Well, my uh, wife knew that I was heavily involved by the time we got involved and married. And so she, as I would say, tolerated it. Uh, she's not interested in it at all. My son is not interested in it. I tried to get him interested in it, but I can't. So they know that I do this, and I spend a significant amount of money doing it, and that's just the way it is, and everybody gets along. She always knows where you are. And she was kind enough to pose in the picture with the antenna in the QST article. Yes, she was. It worked out nicely that way. What do you think the greatest challenge facing amateur radio is now? Do you think about that? Well, yes, I do. And the greatest challenge is we're all getting old. We don't have enough young people coming into the hobby. We need to find ways to make that happen. And unfortunately, I've tried. I've tried with the local school to get interest. I don't know about the teachers themselves. I, I contacted the principal of the school and uh, tried to get him interested in letting the teachers know. And uh, he never answered me. And I tried again and he never answered me the second time. So I became discouraged and sort of insulted. I mean, I think, of course, I have no way of getting hold of the teachers directly. If I could do that, then they might be interested, but I can't. Does your amateur radio club offer... Saturday, one day, get your license seminars? No, we have offered uh, more in-depth license classes in the past, but the people that were teaching it got tired of doing it, and so they stopped, and we haven't resumed it again. I, I don't know what a great idea it is to do just these one-day wonders. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I think that there's a lot of licensees out there who are not active because I think the follow-up after they receive the license isn't there for them. Right. Well, one thing I do just on my own is any local ham who gets a license, I contact them after the fact and invite them to join our local club and I tell them what's going on and things that they can do. Some of them sort of get interested in, others don't. Whenever a new member joins our club, I make it a point to contact them, win the meeting, tell them when the meetings are, invite them to come, to tell them about their opportunities to operate the club station. I offer to make them certificates, which nice certificates of their license and of their membership in the club. And uh, sometimes that helps and sometimes not. How are you notified of new hams in your area? 
Or do you go trolling the FCC database for uh, for new licensees? I have done that in the past and then contacted them, but that didn't seem to work out. I didn't seem to get much results from that. If they pass our license exam, then, of course, we know about them, and those I definitely contact. If they pass the license exam under your auspices or under the auspices of one of the clubs that you belong to? Yes, our club offers license examinations four times a year. What excites you the most about what's happening in amateur radio now? Well, the the new digital modes are taking over everything. So it's both good and bad because you use some things like FT8. There's no conversation at all. You just exchange call signs, essentially. But on the other hand, I see hams of very limited means. We live in apartments with antennas strung up around a room. We're using those technologies can actually work DX pretty well. And so that encourages them and gives hams of limited means and new opportunities to do things. And so I guess it's good after all. Yeah, I just learned last week about a new uh, mode called JS8 Call. Have you heard about that one? Uh, JS8 Call? Yes, I guess that's now the successor to FT8. It has the ability to rag chew in it. And that would be great. I, I'm sure that people will log, go on to that. Do you have advice that you would give to newer returning hams to the hobby? Yes, I do. The most important thing is join a local club because there you will find mentors and make friends and participate in new activities and have people come over to your house and help you put your antenna up. And that's so much better than doing it on your own. Bob, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. I appreciate knowing what's happening out where you are. And, of course, I'm going to look up the SETI program that was active at Ohio State University, and I also think I'm going to look at the Argus antenna as well. So with that, I want to thank you so much for joining me and wish you 73. You can look at uh, ohioargus.org, and that will explain everything about the Argus antenna. Very good to talk to you in 73. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Bob. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in W8ERD in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to both ICOM America and QRP Labs for their support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of these fine sponsors by clicking on their links in the show notes pages or when you make your purchases that you say that you heard it here on QSO Today. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any of the other episodes into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes page. I am grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference. QSO Today is now available on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Libsyn, and TuneIn, as well as the iTunes Store. If you own an Amazon Echo, you can say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. I still use Stitcher to listen to podcasts on my smartphone. The links to all of these services are on the show notes pages on the right side. Until next time, this is Eric for Z1UG 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.